before you even start writing, look, no one's going to care. And that's my favorite approach to marketing. I call it the who gives a shit approach is like, just try to look <laughs> yeah. at all your marketing and, and ask yourself who gives a shit, right? And that's yeah. going to force yeah. you to make changes that are, that are better. By taking that presupposition, you guys had to literally make, make something that's creative. You had, to, you had to figure out a creative solution to this problem. Right, exactly. You are now listening to the Creative Juice Podcast brought to you by Indopreneur.io. What's up, Indies? Welcome back to the Creative Juice Podcast. I'm your host, Circa. With me is a very special guest, all the way from the IndieX agency from the trenches, Jack McCarthy, our IndieX agency lead. How are you doing this morning, Jack? Hello, hello, hello. Thanks for having me in, Cirque. Are you, are you testing your mic as you say hello? No, no, that was real. <laughs> <laughs> That's real. <laughs> very cool. Well, the reason that Jack's here is because branding month is now over and we're squarely in copywriting month here at Entrepreneur, a, a skill that is very necessary on our agency. We write emails, we write ads, we write description text, we write landing pages for uh, tons of different creatives and artists. And it's a crucial skill to have in marketing any business. And when you're starting a business, you're the marketer. So you need to know it. And... It's something that our indies have struggled with historically. And so we wanted to do an entire month on the topic. And who better to do that than a man who writes an obscene amount of copy for all types of artists, Jack. <laughs> Way too much copy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, we're kind of here today to, to transition smoothly from branding month into copywriting month. Talk a little bit about using copy to talk in your brand voice, but ultimately just to have a, a cool combo between me and Jack about copywriting methodology, some do's and don'ts, some major issues we see with musicians who struggle with copy and some major misconceptions that a lot of musicians and, and other types of creators have about copy. Yeah, I think it's such an important thing um, for us to cover, especially as we're transitioning kind of from branding into into this copywriting month, because copywriting can be really overwhelming, especially for musicians who tend to get in their head about the way that they say things, the way that they word things, not about coming, not trying to come off salesy. Um, and these are people who are thinking about a, a lot in a lot of cases, thinking about the way that they, <laughs> the way that they write all the time because they're writing songs, they're putting music together, um, all that sorts of stuff. So I think it's really important to have uh, that kind of discussion and to get the discussion going amongst yeah. everyone in the independent musician community. Yeah, I think also like as people tend to think that like copywriting or sales and marketing is the opposite of what they're trying to do artistically and they get really in their own heads about like being on brand, right? Like they want their brand to be this like rich yep. textured artistic thing, especially in the more youthful genres. Um, hip hop doesn't have this problem as much, but some subsects of hip hop are the worst with it. Like more like artsy hip hop. When you get into like the, the Brockhampton kind of side of things, like the, and the SoundCloud, like uh production side of things, like they're yeah. very much afraid of, Saying like making an offer directly to someone, breaking the fourth wall and talking directly to their audience. They have a lot of hangups about it. And it's weird because typically if you're if you figured out how to construct words into a narrative with a song, and this is not tangential, this is very real. Like if you figured out how to come off the top of a song by saying something that grabs attention and then weave it into a narrative and use a theme to layer over like an analogy or a metaphor into it, you have all these skills built up. Like chances are you'd be a sick copywriter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's so true. Um, and I think, yeah. you know, in, in the world that I come from musically, um, in like the rock, the, the rock and punk world, it's, it's a lot of the same that you were talking about with, you know, not wanting to come across salesy as the way that the, uh, the more artistic, um, inspired hip hop community is as well. Um, but to, to your point about, you know, getting to, getting to, uh, or catching someone's attention in your songwriting and then weaving in a narrative with, uh, with metaphor and, and beautiful storytelling. Yeah. I mean, that's copywriting, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, uh, and to your point about really catching somebody's attention right away, um, 
that's really, you know, it's the idea of getting to the hook. Um, that's like a common, a common talked about idea in songwriting. Um, and so much of that applies to copy as well. You want to hook your, your reader right away. Yeah. And I, and I think there's also this, uh, like a, a misconception that a lot of artists have about writing copy, by the way, if anyone's confused about what we're saying up until this point, copywriting means writing text in marketing. So if you're writing the text that goes in an ad or the text that goes in an email, that's copywriting. <laughs> um, and it started from this. It was probably a good distinct, probably a good distinction to make. Yeah, yeah. It, and really, so copywriting started from this place when all marketing occurred through direct mail. And we're talking like 1920s, 1930s. And the most m revenue generating asset that any business could have was a great sales letter. And sales letters were these long letters that were written by expert copywriters to basically walk someone through all of the psychological triggers for why they should buy. So showing authority, showing social proof, demonstrating that there's scarcity and urgency to the offer. Um, but, but that's just the bare bones of it, right? Like the, those psychological triggers yeah. have to be weaved in through a compelling story told by an attractive character in a certain context. So like there were copywriters who would write letters trying to seem like this person or trying to play up this element of their personality. Maybe they're a bit shy and they're trying to describe how a shy person might encounter this offer and take it. And they're like, I think musicians all too often assume that they have to talk directly to their audience in this like used car salesman, like, you know, low quality television advertisement approach. And that couldn't be further from the truth because those people don't, they may have like, you know, one or two successes kind of randomly, but they don't have a long and storied copywriting career because they don't know the fundamentals of what they're actually doing. They're just like throwing bullshit at the wall, hoping they get lucky. I was going to say, you know, what, what you were saying about the, the narrative and specifically uh, talking about an attractive character in these old copywriting uh, newsletters, um, these old copywriting sales letters that would go out, um, whether it be direct mail or whatever, um, and how these master storytellers were weaving in uh, specifically the type of personality that they wanted the reader to connect with in these, le in these letters to trigger all of these points, all of these <clears throat> psychological triggers to get somebody to buy. Musicians have the same, the same beautiful, amazing um, positioning to be able to do that because likely you're already presenting an attractive character, you know, a personality that your fans are resonating with that's out there. So you just need to learn how to tap into yeah. that and speak in it in your copy. I think that it's amazing um, <laughs> that your musicians, artists are like positioned perfectly for that kind of thing. Yeah. And it's like they've already cultivated this attractive character. And now it's just like that exactly. final step of like, OK, how does that character talk to its audience? And and you know mm -hmm. what? Like if it if the, if your character or, or your persona that you've cultivated for your artistry doesn't speak directly to the audience. Good. Make that yeah. the challenge. You know what I mean? Like I think people stop short of actually completing copywriting tasks or goals. People even go so far as to never send an email to the email list they're cultivating just because they're afraid to take that final step and figure out how does me as an artist talk to my audience. And, and it can be anything. Yeah. It can be anything it, the, for every for every circumstance you might find yourself in, being limited by brand voice, being limited by the audience you're speaking to, being limited by the cool points you're gaining by like putting sepia on everything and fucking acting as if you, you like no one knows who you are, like that kind of ultra artistic shit. Yeah. Like, you know, whatever <laughs> yeah. your limitations are, there is a copywriting solution for those limitations. You're just not. Yeah. I, I think all too often artists don't adopt an attitude of, oh, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do it well. They, they say, ah, oh, I suck at this or I'm, I'm not so good at this or this, this seems weird or this seems this. They take this presupposition, which becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy that the task at hand is bullshit and that even if it weren't bullshit, they couldn't do it. <laughs> yep. <laughs> it's that little voice in your head that says like, oh, well, I'm not going to do this. And then you don't. Yeah. Or this is stupid and I'm not going to do it. And, and they've encountered that voice before when writing songs for the first time. Yep. And they act yeah. like they've never seen it before. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And imagine, imagine if you applied that same 
if you're an artist that's you know struggling with writing copy and you just don't know how to send emails or you're you're struggling with how to structure your posts on Facebook or your Facebook ads or whatever imagine if you took the same that same like paralyzing um, show stopping fear that little voice in your head imagine if you took that and you applied that to you know the first I don't know, the first 50 songs that you wrote at the very beginning of your career when you were probably 13 years old and sitting in your bedroom with a guitar and you said, well, this is stupid. What would you, you wouldn't, where, where would you be? <laughs> you know, yeah. and, yeah. and it's, it's no different. Uh, and, I, and it's a lot about mindset there, obviously, which is, um, you know, probably a discussion for another time. But um, I think it is really important to recognize that it's a stumbling block and it's something that you have to, you have to push through and you have to be willing to test it. Um, I can't tell you. And I mean, Cirque, you know this, um, but just for, for our listeners, like at Indie X, like we have so many, we have artists that come on board that a lot of times they haven't been emailing a huge list of audience, a, a huge list of fans that they've been cultivating in email or in right. messenger or whatever. And they just haven't been reaching out to them. And you start to pinpoint why and it's like, oh, they just don't know what to say or they don't know how to say it. Right. And then, you know, it, it, it just shows that this is it's almost like an epidemic. <laughs> it's um, yeah. And I think it's something that, you know, artists really need to work towards fixing within themselves. And uh, you're going to build better relationships with your fans by talking to them. Yeah, 100 percent. And so, yeah, in this episode, I, I definitely want to cover. We have a recent addition to the IndieX team who is an amazing copywriter whose name is Jesse Gillen Walters. We had an interview with him in episode, and I'm going to take a second to find this real quick, but I believe that we interviewed him in episode um, in episode 75. We interviewed Basic Printer. Now he's a member of the IndieX team because his ads and his emails are fire. Just like Ed Isola of the 502s, who's also on our team. Um, they're both great copywriters. And Basic Printer is fully his, his own persona in his copy. He uses it to his advantage. The reason his copy is so good is because it's not what someone told him to do. It's him taking in some basic tenets of copywriting and and you know, filtering it through his persona and what his artistic persona is. So I want to talk about his copywriting and, and kind of what adds – led us to bring him on the team or, or talk about his style. But I also want to cover just, just kind of understanding that everything is a sales letter. And, and I first got, I first fell in love with copywriting by learning the history of direct mail and sales letters and reading really great, successful sales letters. And I'm going to put some links in the show notes of this episode. If you go to entrepreneur.io slash episode 91, there will be some links to some historic sales letters. Now, obviously these are going to be cringeworthy. If you think about them as going out, you know, <laughs> as, as a, as a music, uh, advertisement, obviously, because they weren't meant for that. That's not but the point. if you yeah. can put yourself, yeah, put yourself in the mindset of like what it took to write these and recognize that like, yes, depending on what was said in this section, it had a different result than, than other sales letters and copywriters test this across many different iterations, but ultimately a sales letter follows a formula of distributing information, of communicating a an opportunity. And that typically falls into a classic formula and we'll go over copywriting formulas in another episode in this uh, episode series during copywriting month. But AIDA is the traditional formula, which is attention, interest, desire, action, you know, attention. Um, do you have trouble ever writing emails to your audience? Don't know what to say to your fans. Don't know how to talk to them. Well, I've got your attention if you've got that problem, right? And then interests. What if I told you that if you listen to this podcast series, that would no longer be a problem for you. You'd be able to write copy comfortably all the time and you'd be you in the process. You wouldn't be salesy or annoying. Now I've got your interest because I've communicated a future state that's desirable to you, right? Now I have to dig in on that and generate that desire by explaining how I'm going to do it, by validating it, by showing you that it is true that I can bring you there. And then action. Hey, listen now, right? It's very simple. Uh, all you got to do, very easy. Just click play. Listen to what we're saying and take note of it, and you will be a better copywriter, right? So there's some there's some solid copy. 
Right, exactly. Now, obviously, that's not going to be what yours is, right? Because you have to generate attention, interest, desire, and action in different ways depending on what your brand is. But it all boils down to that. And when you think about it like that, everything is a sales letter. Everything. A video you watch is a sales letter. This podcast is a sales letter. Ads are sales letters. Landing pages are sales letters. Every email you send is a sales letter. What the action is differs. How you generate desire and interest differs. How you grab attention differs depending on what the, what the purpose of it is and what the medium is. But it all boils back down to that sales letter formula. Yep. Yeah, it's so true. I mean, even look at things like tour flyers, although not not <laughs> not typically done in a way that I would say is like grade A copy. A tour flyer is a sales letter. The design the design generates the attention, yep. right? And then and then like the headline acts generate the interest, the desires, you know, kind of driven home with the with the who, what, where, why. In the action, right? Go here to buy tickets. Yep. Uh, it's funny that you mentioned Jesse because when I joined the team uh, here at Entrepreneur, one of the first trainings that I was working on and I was recording a video for was a copywriting training in our uh, tour marketing module in Indie Pro. Um, and I was looking for examples um, in the Indies group and just trying to give a primer on how to write copy. And <laughs> basic printer examples were like the first thing that came to mind. And I remember reaching out to you and I was like, hey, is it OK if we highlight Jesse here? Like his copy is bomb. <laughs> um, so yeah. that was my that was one of my first um, one of my first exposures to Jesse's copywriting. And uh, he's just tremendously talented at it. So obviously, we're very, very excited to have him uh on the team at IndieX, and the same goes with Ed. Both of them are phenomenal copywriters. Um, really, like, yeah. specifically, like, when I read Jesse's copy, I hear it in his voice, and as someone who's listened to his music and, you know, followed him on social media, I know what his music sounds like, I know what his brand voice is like, so then when I read his copy and I hear it and it all resonates the way that I expect it to in my head as a listener, that's what we're getting at here when it comes to connecting, you know, your overall brand and your voice and the way that your relationships with your fans are structured, how you talk to them. If you can bridge that gap into your copywriting, you're there. That's that's exactly where you should be. And Jesse's a prime example of somebody who does that. Yeah. And I mean, 10 times out of 10. Totally. Yeah. It, it, like his copy is always funny. Every ad he does has this like unique spin on it. And Mm -hmm. He did an ad recently for a show where he was like, look, you know, this is an ad. You know how this works, right? <laughs> it starts it off with that, which yeah. immediately commands attention because it stands out from everything you're seeing in your newsfeed. And then he continues on to very quickly deliver the information. And the reason he gives is that he doesn't want to waste your time. Like, and so he just says like, I'm doing this show. Like, uh, you know, he gives all the relevant information, how to buy. And then he says, okay you can continue scrolling now. And it's like, dude, I fall in love with that ad, right? Like when I see that in my newsfeed, it's a, yep. it's a welcomed break from all the bullshit and terrible kind of like just paint by numbers copywriting that we're seeing. And that's kind of like the point is like, if your copywriting is paint by numbers, if it's, if it's, if your copywriting ends up being the thing that you're afraid it will be. Yeah. Failure. Right. That's a, that's a fail. Yep. If your copywriting is unique to your brand voice, if it stands out, if it's something completely different than what, you know, the traditional marketing copy is, that's a success usually. I saw um, recently, and I I'm sure you've seen this ad before, Jack, uh, Peng Jun, who's like a ClickFunnels-y guy, mm -hmm. you know, he's, he's, a, he's yep. one of the personalities in the marketing space. He wrote his copywriters, I'm sure, because he probably doesn't write his own ads anymore. But someone wrote this ad that was like, yada, 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 I tried this thing, yada, yada, you know, face challenges, but then big success, blah, blah, blah. Here's my credentials, blank, you know, and then he says, click here, you know, the you know, the thing webinar, <laughs> yep. like just like <laughs> bullshitting yep. through it. Hilarious ad. And, and so someone below was like, I wonder how this is doing. And he wrote back, it's crushing it. <laughs> <laughs> I saw another, I saw another similar ad recently, and maybe we're going to start seeing this as a trope in marketing land, uh, especially in like the guru space. Uh, it was just like, blah, 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 pattern interrupt blah, blah, blah. <laughs> yeah. Pain point, pain point. Right. Um, and it was the same sort of ad. I can't remember who it was. Um, 
but it, it was definitely one of those click funnels, uh, yeah. marketing guru type guys. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I'm wondering if, but, and yeah, same, same sort of thing. I'm sure it's killing it. Yeah. Cause it's different. And it's like, yeah, that only works so many times, which is why every time you you're up at bat to write some copy, it should be new. It should be unique to the situation that's facing you. It shouldn't be paint by numbers. You can use formulas to guide you, but ultimately it should be a unique spin on everything. And I think that when you look at it as a challenge like that, it becomes very much like songwriting, right? You don't want any song to be- I was just be, gonna say that. Yeah, <laughs> you don't want anything to be formulaic against the last <laughs> thing you wrote. And that that presents this sort of like, yes, it's scary, but it's also exciting kind of opportunity. So, yeah, I, and, and that totally resonates with me. And, and, you know, I'm sure a lot of our listeners and, and people who write songs, um, something that comes to mind is um, when I was first studying music theory, like back in the day, um, and I know some people study music theory, some people don't, just listen, this is relevant. <laughs> um <laughs> When you're first studying music theory, you get stuck on like, oh, but this is rules. It's telling me how to do something. Like, I don't, I don't want to follow this. Like, I just want to sit with my guitar, my piano, and play the song. Like, write the songs that I want to write. Fine, sure, that's great. But the whole purpose of having the framework is so that you learn it, you internalize it, and then you break the rules to make it your own. That's really yeah. the point. Like, the music came first, sure. Like, if we go back to the to the history of music and, and how theory was developed, the music was coming first. Um, the theory was written later to be, a you know, guidelines for for the, the, the people who were, you know, the successors of the craft. Before you can do anything different, you got to understand what's regular, and then you have a yeah. framework to understand what's different. Yep, exactly. And I think if, if you're if you're struggling with copywriting and um, you're particularly struggling with the idea of it being formulaic and maybe you've maybe you've looked up copywriting formulas and you get it, but you don't quite know how to take it to the next level. This is what I would challenge you to do um, is write something that's a formula. If you get that like gripping feeling in your stomach or in your chest that like, oh, this copy is so stock and like bullshitty take it and throw like four wrenches in it. <laughs> and then you will probably be way better off with a piece of copy that you're happier with. Like just take what you did yeah. and un take what you did and take that piece of work and unlearn it. <laughs> and, um, you'll probably have a piece of copy that you're way happier with. Yeah. That would be my suggestion. If you're, fe if you're feeling stuck. And these are parallel skills, like get investing into copywriting is investing into your writing as a whole. Cause like, Almost all writing these days is persuasive to one element or another, uh, unless you're doing, you know, um, unless you're fiction writing. And, and even then, you're kind of trying to lead people to a conclusion or a feeling or a state of being that they're not naturally yeah. in. And that's that's just what all writing is. It's, it leads. And I've since I've committed myself to becoming better at copywriting, becoming better at communicating messages – a few things have happened on the copywriting side of things that have made it better for me as a songwriter. Uh, one of them was to imagine that I'm talking to someone that I'm completely comfortable talking to. When And I mean, even if you're very timid, there's probably someone in your life where that timidity kind of fades away and you're like truly yourself and you wish you could be that at parties, but you're not like that's, that's a common thing is there, there's usually someone in yes. your life who you are that comfortable with and you just can't cultivate it in a normal scenario, but in a copywriting scenario or in a songwriting scenario, you can take the private time to put yourself in front of that person and talk to them as you would. And I've been doing that with my songs more and more and it's, it's helped tremendously. Yeah, for sure. I think, uh, on a similar note, as I've like, as I've invested in my copywriting skills and I've taken the time to hone that, that part of my, you know, my skill set, I've definitely found the same thing with my songwriting. It's become, my songwriting has become clearer. Um, I've definitely learned how to be more concise in the way that I say things. I've been guilty over the years of when I write songs being very, very wordy in a way that, um, doesn't necessarily aid the melodic flow. <laughs> if you feel me, things tend to get jumbled. Um, which is, which has always been kind of like a challenge of my own in songwriting, but through honing my copywriting, I've, you know, I've kind of begun to overcome that. So like there's there, I think there's val validity in, in working in, you know, working in copy, even if that's not like your principal, um, 
your principal um, task when it comes to your music, whether you're, you know, maybe you have a team working on your music marketing or someone else in your band is handling, you know, the email marketing or the writing of ad copy or social media copy or whatever. Even if that's not your thing, I would recommend like everybody crack into it, especially if you're a songwriter, just because of the, um, the tertiary benefits that come with it. Yeah. hundred percent. And, and like for me, my journey with songwriting started with, with poetry in, in grade school and then evolved out into writing songs and then out to copy, but they all kind of serve each other. So like from poetry, I learned intense meter, especially studying Poe. Like if you ever study Edgar Allan Poe, you learn that there's a rhythm to every syllable. You learn how some syllables fit better than others. You learn how to select pretty syllables and, and arrange them in sequence in a way that's pleasing. There's so much rhythm and so much, you know, intense selection in posed work. And that can really inform the rhythm of all your writing, whether it be, you know, intended to be in a song or intended to be read as a poem or not. Because one thing that we know about copywriting is that rhymes help and meter helps. If you can write rhythmically, it's going to work better. And that's just proven out time and time again. And so these things have a high degree of transfer. Another one that's really, really helped out my songwriting is uh, one of my favorite marketers who we mention all the time, Ryan Dice of Digital Marketer. He talks about how he'll take blog articles from his writers and lop off the first paragraph usually because they're oftentimes doing what's called burying the lead or kind of taking the most exciting element and putting it after a paragraph of explanation and preposition, which is entirely unnecessary. And I realized that like, okay, I want to grab attention with my songs. If I have 10 seconds of someone's attention with a song, I need to keep it. I need to get them invested, launch them into a space. And so as a result, a lot of the songs that I've written in the last year, like I'm going to pull up my lyrics here. One of my songs starts with, um, I was born with two brothers, but one died inside of the womb. And if you hear that in the beginning of a song, it's like, whoa, (laughs) you know, like it's pretty intense. (laughs) Um, you know, and like, that's not true, but it, it sets up, first of all, I thought of that because of the rhythm of it. Cause the, um, it's got this, uh, this ska rhythm to it. So the upstrokes don't cut, cut, cut. Everything's on the, uh, on the three. Right. And so, Mm -hmm. so, so that born with, I was born with two brothers, but one died inside of the womb. Right. So the rhythm of it, and, yep. and the goal of, of saying something that was incendiary or attention grabbing or alarming, that, that gave me that first line. It's not about anything in my life, but now that I have it, I can use it as a metaphor and connect it after the fact to all this narrative and all these elements of my life and how I feel. And sometimes the rhythm and the need inform what your copy is going to be or what your song is going to be. And that's helped me tremendously. Another one is, um, is, uh, I, I think I've got a tumor in my right lung. That's the beginning of one of my songs because it grabs you. It's like, what <laughs> do you, <laughs> you know, it's the, it's the, it's the, it's the lyrical equivalent of a pattern interrupt. Exactly. And so yep. the, I kind of just through that prism, you can see how these are very related skills and they're good skills to have as a creative. Definitely. Yeah. Um, and I love those lyrics, man. Really, really cool. Um, <laughs> thanks for sharing. That's dope. Thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think, uh, well, I hope that what we've kind of been reiterating and kind of just, you know, Cirque and I have kind of just been like piggybacking with each other about here. Um, my hope is that as you and I are talking about this, that it just nails the point home that of how musicians are so wonderfully positioned to be awesome copywriters. I think that that's like one of my biggest goals is to inspire people to think that they are so that they will become, um, you know what I mean? Like, I think that that's, I think that that's super important. And like as songwriters, especially and creatives, um, that's, that's basically my, you know, that's, that's been what I was thinking about as we were getting ready to, to record this podcast was I want to make sure that we reiterate, like you're in such a, an awesome, I'll I'll even go far as go so far as to say privileged position to be 
creatively endowed that you could be a really, really badass copywriter yeah. if you just set your mind to it. Yeah, and and you can literally envelop your audience in a world with every email you send. Like your creative brilliance should show through in every ad, in every post, in every email. Um, and and when you approach copywriting as some foreign challenge to you that doesn't gel with your creative spirit, you're basically you know, you're basically leaving out in the cold something that you should naturally be wanting to do all the time. <laughs> yep. Yeah, exactly. Not to mention it, it opens up. I think it opens up like, oh, it, or it can open up a world of different things that you can do with your music and with your creativity. Something that comes to mind here is the band Coheed and Cambria. Um, they're like a, yeah, if, if you're not totally. familiar with them, they're like a, pop punk emo rock rock band that's evolved since the I guess like the late 90s through the 2000s uh, era of that boom of pop punk and all first off all, their songwriting is brilliant it's all conceptual every record is a is a chapter in this in this essentially this saga that they've put together um but no, but with that they have these comic books um and they yeah. they weave a whole narrative into it and it's amazing like this is what I'm talking about when it comes to copywriting is like, and you don't have to necessarily put it into a comic book, but like you can weave narratives into everything you do, um, into all the emails you write, um, into every post ad, whatever it might be, wherever your copy ends up living. Maybe you're sending letters to your biggest fans. Um, and you're, you know, you're giving them a diary that essentially has a call to action at the end. Um, you're giving them say, you know, direct mail sales letters, basically. Um, yeah. there's so much that you can do when you, when you understand what you can do with copy, I think. Um, and I think yeah. it's a huge untapped resource for, for artists. Another tip that can really help you out with writing any email, any ad and, and writing songs is to figure out what your analog is for conversational style. And what I mean by that is before you sit down to write, okay, are you, are you talking as you would if you were interrupting someone's phone conversation and just had to quickly get some information to them, which is what Jesse chose to do with that ad we referenced earlier in the podcast. Are you writing a manifesto that's supposed to serve as something that someone might frame and put on their wall and remind them of who they are? You know, like what is the context you're writing in? Because that transposes like a roadmap for you. And there's so many different tricks to do that. Like, like I said, that, that, that first line, I know, I knew I wanted to get an attention grabbing first line. Well, that set me up with a metaphor that I now have to explain and make the song about that is a creative challenge that is better than doing it from scratch and flying blind. It's better to have a template yeah. that forces you into some creative corner than, than to just like be like, oh, I'm just going to write a song. It's like, no, set up some parameters beforehand and then follow those into these amazing creative discoveries, these eureka moments. That's my favorite way to write. And it's something that can make copywriting more fun. Oh, I'm going to write this ad as if blank, right? Um, and I know yeah. I have to grab attention. How am I going to grab attention? You, I, I almost like it when my writing challenge is not a choice of mine. It's something that is forced by how I opened up or what I said in the beginning or what I decided was going to be the context for, for which I'm saying this in. Um, so yeah, like if you can set up templates for you to follow – and oftentimes when you're writing songs, like your chord progression, your rhythm, those are forcing you into a space that, that is, a, provides a creative limitation because creativity is all about limitation. So set up some yeah. walls for yourself, you know, and you'll have a great time doing it. Yeah, definitely. I love that. Um, I think, you know, an another analogy that you could think about is, I, am I writing this email or am I writing this song as if I'm like, you know, whispering in somebody's ear, I'm like quietly waking them up right. or am I standing in a crowd of people with a megaphone at a protest? What am I doing? What, what, what's right. the frame that I'm writing in? Um, or what's the frame that I'm speaking in and how do I translate that to a written word? Yeah. And this is how like the best copywriters are doing this. It's because they're artists, 
right? The best copywriters are artists. Yep. You're already an artist. So you just need that conduit to get you into treating this like a creative challenge rather than some boring fucking khaki wearing, you know, marketer thing, right? <laughs> it's not. It's yep, and, and for sure. kind of all of it all of it can be that. You can put it in that box and you can say I'm no good at that or that's not my brand or that's not what I got into this for, or you can realize all the ways in which it's an extension of your creativity and in the same breath start doing really, really well at it. Yeah, definitely. I think, um, I think another cool exercise to, to try out, um, if you're, if you're the kind of person who sees copy and it makes you cringe, um, let's say for instance, I I mean, here's an example. We see this all the time. Um, you see a Facebook ad from a band that says new single out now stream here, download here, Go to our website here. Tour dates here. Nothing more th- salesy than that, dude. Yeah, worst <laughs> thing ever. So here's what I challenge you to do. When you see things, if, if you're the type of person that, you know, you know what you... A lot of people come at uh, anything creative, really. <laughs> um, they come at it from a place of, I know what I don't like, but they don't necessarily know what they do like, or they don't necessarily know what they would want to do for themselves. So what I would challenge you to do is when you see something that you don't like, write it down, like literally write down that ad that you see in a notebook, write it down word for word, and then rewrite it in a way or skew it, rewrite it, make it your own in a way that would take out all the bullshit that you don't like. I think that can be a really cool, that can be a really cool way to like develop what it is that you like about copy so that you can then apply that to whatever it is that you're going to be writing. Another great thing to do, which we've been doing in the group forever, if you go to, if you're a member of Indie Pro, you go to our Indies group and you search swipe, you'll find tons of examples of swiped marketing copy that people store to inspire them later on. But what Jack's talking about yeah. is an anti-swipe file. What, what do you, like a file of ads that just to you are shitty and boring and markety. And you, and it informs your list of rules for what not to do or to turn it on its head. Dude, uh, one of my, one of my last founders, my final founders who actually was in the office recently and we recorded a video, but, uh, the file got corrupted, which sucks, but, um, Brett Newski, and you might see me wearing the don't listen to Brett Newski t-shirt in some of our content. Um, he came by the office when we were working together, he did a album launch, uh, ad for his sales offer that was basically him with like pillows in his shirt. So he's like a fat guy with a fake mustache on. And he, he, he took the idea of salesy markety stuff and flipped it on its head. So he acted literally like a used car salesman and said, Brett, Brett Newski Toyota or something like that. Um, or no, not Brett Newski Toyota. He, he came up with a name for the guy and he did a video sales letter that was like the salesiest thing that he could possibly muster. <laughs> and it was hilarious awesome. and it was great. And it was a perfect example of how you can use your creativity to do exactly the opposite of what you don't like. Right. Make yeah, fun of it. You so know, great. like the, the, yep. stopping short at, I don't like s- being salesy just kind of denies your own intelligence. Like, obviously, if you don't like it, do something different. (laughs) And and, I mean, let's be real for a second here. Like, artists do that already. They do that in their songs. Look at people like Eminem. He's making fun of people constantly. Look at bands like Blink-182, who every music video that they did in the 90s was making fun of boy bands. (laughs) You know? Like, you're already doing, you're likely already doing that in some way, shape, and form. And so just apply that to your copywriting or make yourself an anti-swipe file. Yeah, 100%. So I think we've covered some some good tips here for how you can start looking at copywriting and just designing marketing in a different way. Um, You know, it it should be an extension of your creativity. and, And hopefully we've given you lots of examples for how that's true. And. And certainly, you know, there's tons of people to check out. If you go to Basic Printer's Facebook page and you look at his info and ads, you can see some examples of some great copywriting going on. But we definitely wanted to clear this up and and get copywriting months kicked off in the right way because it's probably the number one thing that we see artists getting hangups about is writing copy, writing emails, writing sales pages, all that stuff is they they don't want to seem salesy but they have no clear, reliable definition for what that means. 
And they haven't really explored how, you know, we're not asking you to be salesy. In fact, quite the opposite. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's a particular stalling point, I think, for, <laughs> for artists and creatives because – if you don't write copy, it essentially will, it will stall your whole marketing machine. <laughs> you know, yeah. whether it's one piece or it's all the pieces, eventually you're going to need to write copy. So like, I think that's why oh it's so God, important. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, that's what, it's like, if you do it, it's an incredible benefit and it's something that can fulfill you creatively. And if you don't do it, it's the opposite. It's not just as if you don't have that benefit, you have the opposite right? Yep. You're, you're missing out on all that opportunity that's there to communicate your brand and your personality to your audience. Cause every bit of marketing copy you write is a touch point that reinforces your brand's notions. Yep. And if you're not doing that and, and not showing people who you are creatively, then you're, you're basically wasting time. You know, you're, you're literally letting time just slip through your fingers that you could be reinforcing that brand, getting brand equity and creating experiences for people that are memorable. Um, and, and you don't have to violate your brand voice to do it. I know Jack, you probably get copy, like copy reviews is probably a big part of your time at IndieX, right? Yeah, definitely. And people, so tell me a little bit about that before we close out here. Like people are often worried about about these exact things. <laughs> yeah. You know, so it was like I was saying earlier, like uh, when it, when it comes to like, when it comes to artists, one, I guess it kind of goes on a scale. There's like one, which is like total, per, total paralysis, like inability to do something because they can't write copy or they think they can't write copy. So because they're not writing copy, they're not sending emails or because they're not writing copy, they're not running ads. Um, whatever that might look like, that's like, that's like the, the one on the scale, right? It's, it's stall because it's, because they can't write copy, they are, totally stuck with a piece of their marketing puzzle. Um, that's probably, so working through that often looks, often looks like talking to the artist, talking to an artist, whether it's a, an agency client or whether it's, um, one of the indies in our community on indies live or in a consult or something like that. Um, is talking with them about who they are, who their fans are, how they communicate, uh, in the places that they are communicating, whether that's on you know Facebook Live or on YouTube or at shows, whatever that might be, um, and trying to hone in on what that communication style looks like. Um, so that's like at the lowest level of the scale, and then you know it kind of there's a spectrum of like looking at ad copy and de and and determining okay, are you really speaking to are you really speaking to your fans or are you just kind of putting something out there to people who you know, this isn't going to resonate with your people because you're not identifying with them. You're following a formula. So what can right. we do to, to tweak this and make it more you? Um, that's what I, that's like the kind of the, I would say like the middle of the road is like, it's formulaic, but it's not in your, you know, yeah, you're your just space. sort of like hanging ornaments of your brand on an existing tree, right? Like you're right. You're, exactly. You're like maybe changing some words, but if you change those back to the typical words, it's like, boilerplate marketing copy. Exactly. Yep, exactly. Um, and then at the, at the further end of the scale, it, it goes down to just identifying Jesse, Jesse Gillen Walters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Jesse, exactly. It's identifying, I would say it's, it's testing really like, and, and I know that's yeah. kind of a cop out and it's kind of a cop out answer, but like you have to test this stuff. Like you're not going to nail it the first time that the first time that any campaign goes out with a new style of copy or any style of copy, whether it's new, old, whatever, um, you're not going to nail it the first time. So it's kind of watching what was working and, you know, iterating on it as you go. So I think that's like the, the other end of the scale. <laughs> it's yeah. not paralysis. It, it's not paralysis. It's movement. It's identifying what's working, looking at what's not, um, how could we rephrase this better? What kind of feedback are we getting from the fans, um, or the audience, whatever that might be, um, to help us determine how we can make this better as we go forward. Totally. And, and so that's kind of an, I guess that's kind of more of an esoteric answer than maybe just like doing copy reviews, but that's no, kind of how no. I look at it. It's just, I know you guys get a lot of copy back and not a whole lot of client input as to what that copy should be. And it's because these skills aren't practiced enough. And I think, um, 
a point that you made there is incredibly important, which is like, don't just sit down to write one copy block, sit down to write one and then an alternate of that. And then one that's nothing like those other two, you know, and and when we do our ad grids, a lot of time, you know, and and this is something I'm guilty of, like I'll, you know, have, you know, multiple options for post texts, like five of them, but they'll only differ by like one variable very slightly. And that's not a good test because it's very unlikely that this one tiny copy change is going to yield much of an impact. So you take that, like what you first wrote, and it's like, all right, how do we do the exact opposite or something that's worlds apart from this? And testing many different things to find out what's working for you because that's a true creative challenge, right? It's a true creative challenge to be like, no, not just one creative piece, but multiple uh, that express different types of creativity. I think it's exciting. Um, and, and not, not enough people are able to see it as the exciting creative challenge that it is. (laughs) Um, but you know, there's a point at which you get to this place after testing a lot, after getting a lot of the lead out or, or, you know, pouring out the the terrible stuff, which is part of any skill, is just get out those terrible first tries, you know, and and do it. Um, yep. And once you get to you get to this place where it's like, no, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna start by writing. I'm gonna start by first examining what I want people to do as a result of reading this or seeing this, and then I'm going to examine who do I want to do it, and then I'm going to examine some limitations I can set up for myself, maybe the context of how I'm saying it, maybe what Jack said, where it's like, what what scenario am I in? How do I visually paint? Am I whispering it to them? Am I yelling it over a crowd? Am I speaking on a microphone from a stage? What, you know, like what, what uh, conversational style do I employ here? And then you're going to write. And doing that prep work of getting yourself in the right place and understanding the limitations you wanna set up puts you in that creative space and it becomes a challenge instead of uh, a, a threat, which is you really want the challenge response to this. You don't want that threat response where you're like, I don't know how to do anything and I've never learned anything <laughs> before and I'm incapable. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And I think something that I wanted to mention here, um, you were talking about you know, creating multiple creatives to, to really do a true test. And just to like, just to kind of, you know, back up Cirque's point, like I'm definitely, I'm definitely, um, guilty of that as well of kind of well this is good enough <laughs> and I'm, yeah. a co- I'm you know I write copy all the time so like sometimes when I have a gut feeling that something's good enough like I can trust that gut feeling but um to your point I think like when it comes to when it comes to creating tests something that I like to do and, and you kind of you kind of touched on this is like do something totally the opposite of what you just wrote so like let's say you wrote a long form ad um so then do a short form ad that's one line, right? Yeah. Like your, your, your variations don't have to be like, they don't have to trip you up or freak you out. Like sometimes the simplest iteration is right in front of your eyes. It could be just like uh, a total change of who you're addressing or uh, what kind of pain point you're talking about with them. Or like I said, uh, long form versus short form uh, or a totally different call to action or a way that you're framing the call to action. This doesn't yeah. really need to be like rocket science or overwhelming. Um, anyway, yeah, I wanted to I wanted to mention that, that like, yes, you should absolutely come up with multiple variants to give yourself true tests. But no, you shouldn't overwhelm yourself and paralyze yourself in the process of doing so. Sometimes the solution is right in front of your nose, and it's it's a lot easier than you think. Um, so that was one thing that I wanted to mention, and I, I wanted to just share a little story. Um, I was actually this I didn't think about this till right now, but I was writing some email copy yesterday um, for one of the IndieX artists, and what we were working on doing in this uh, in this email is he's debuting a new website. And the idea here was, why the hell should his fans care (laughs) that he's debuting a new website? Like, okay, he's put together a new website. It looks really, really nice. That's cool. But, like, that's not enough to make his fans go to it. Like, why should they give a crap? Um, So that's what I was focusing on in writing this email. And so his whole website and why he was putting it together was it's, it's kind of like an anti-artist website. Um, it's really not focused on him as an artist as much as it is the community that he's building with his fans, what they're doing together. They're heavily involved in service work. Um, and so all of his, his new website is all built around that. Um, it's all built around what they're doing together and it's way more about the fan 
and the community than it is about him. So when I was writing the email copy, I was like, oh, well, that's why they should give a crap because it's about them. The website is totally about them. So I was when I was writing the email, I literally spelled that out. The email said, you might be wondering why should I care about this? <laughs> and yeah. then I went into it and I said, well, I didn't want this to be a showy artist website. What I wanted it to do was be the opposite. I wanted it to showcase you. So I did that and I worked really hard with my team to put that together and I want your feedback on it. So it created this environment where it was like, why should I care? I should care because it's about me. Oh, he, he built this about me and about the community that we're doing together and the relationship that I have with this artist and now he wants my feedback on it. If I was a reader, I'd be like, oh, that's great. That's amazing. I'm going to click on this and then I'm going to send him a reply email. That's what I was working to cultivate. So it was putting, trying to, trying to not only put um, where I was writing, you know, the frame of what I was trying to write in was, you know, thinking, why should somebody care about this? And I was also putting myself in the frame of the reader to be like, why should I care about this and why should I take action on it? Um, so anyway, that was just kind of like a, an example that I wanted to share of how I framed my thinking in an actual concrete uh, <laughs> copy experience that just happened less than 24 hours ago. Right. And, and it's amazing because just by setting up some presuppositions there, you're creating the limitations that draw out the creativity. You're saying before you even start writing, look, no one's going to care. And that's my favorite approach to marketing. I call it the who gives a shit approach is like, just try to look <laughs> yeah. at all your marketing and, and ask yourself who gives a shit. Right. And that's yeah. going to force yeah. you to make changes that are, that are better by taking that presupposition. You guys had to literally make, make something that's creative. You had to, you had to figure out a creative solution to this problem. And that unlocked your creativity as an artist, you know, by, by approaching that as a challenge. And I think that's so important. Uh, one of my favorite challenges, with, especially with email copywriting, is like, how do we make this seem like it's something their friend sent them? How do we, first of yeah. all, like, let's not capitalize all the subject line. You know, let's try to keep the subject line very short. Let's not try to grab a like markety style attention from the subject line. Let's try to literally make the subject line like ignorable. Because that's the types of yep. subject lines that our friends write. And in the context of an email subject line, ignorable is good. Ignorable, you can't ignore because it's something your friend sent you. So the, by putting yourself with, into the context of those limitations, it unlocks your creative potential. If you approach it by – because a lot of people, they stop at where their limitations should be. That should be the start of your limitations. If you stop at, I don't want to be salesy. No, continue and say, okay, limitation is it can't be salesy. So we can't do X, Y, and Z. Okay, great. Now you're setting up a framework for how you're going to write it instead of giving me a reason why you can't write it. So Right. And it, it also forces you to identify, sorry to interrupt, it no. also forces you to identify um, what is X, Y, Z for you? What is salesy for you? Right. Because salesy for you is way different than what's salesy for me, you know? Yeah. Hundred percent. So hopefully, we we've just kind of broken the ice here with this episode. We're gonna have some more like specifically themed episodes in this copywriting month. But uh, you know, don't don't worry if if it didn't all click for you in this episode. I hope we've unlocked a whole lot of new ideas for you, and I hope we I hope we've made copywriting exciting as a challenge for you. But we're gonna be here all month, so stick around. You're stuck with copywriting. We'll see you next time. <laughs> Hell yeah. Um, thank you so much, Jack, for joining me on Copywriting Month. Thanks I'm very excited to, to dive deep into this. And thank you guys for listening. I sincerely hope I see some stuff that I can stick in my swipe file from you guys very soon. Because it, one of the most inspiring things that, that, that has happened to me in, in recent memory is like literally seeing basic printers ads in my newsfeed and being like, dude, I quit. <laughs> <laughs> Yep, I, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. I'm hoping my swipe file grows uh, grows by multiples. Yeah, 100%. And, and we'll see all of you indies next week on Creative Juice. Peace out. Everybody.